Now, the main reason we are here today is very much bittersweet to all of us in TAM and HES. When Dr. Laurel Wilson announced her retirement, <laughs> I'm going to get all choked up. I honestly didn't know how we would be able to manage without her. But of course, we are happy that Howard and Laurel have their new puppy and plan to enjoy life traveling in their Subaru. Now, every time I see those Subaru ads on TV, I know that they had Laurel and Doug. Laurel. <laughs> I wonder who Doug is. <laughs> Laurel, <laughs> Laurel and Howard in mind when they made those commercials because they are definitely outdoorsy, adventuresome, and always ready for action. So Subaru and the Wilsons go hand in hand. Dr. Wilson came to the University of Missouri in September of 1985 as a fresh graduate from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Since her arrival, she has been a trailblazer with a long list of publications, awards, and exhibits to her name. These accomplishments earned her rank of full professor in 2005. Laurel is the curator of the Missouri Historic Costume and Textile Collection, a love that she shares with anyone willing to listen. Often, if we don't find Laurel in her office, she is in the collection, giving each artifact loving care and attention. I remember a few years back when the department received a donation of several boxes labeled in bold black magic marker, Granny's Old Clothes. Soon, Laurel was running up and down the hall screaming <laughs> as loud as she could because in those boxes labeled Granny's old clothes were several Fortunis. Now, if you don't know who Fortuni is, go look that one up. <laughs> Her excitement of this donation and all, all that she ever does with it never ceases. Laurel is the recipient of the Kemper Excellence in Teaching Award and characteristic to Laurel's style, she donated her $10,000 award to the costume collection. This noble act resulted in the Commerce Bank matching that and starting the wonderful endowment that she uh, spends lots of money on. <laughs> she has built the reputation of the collection so that not only are we well aware of, her, of it here in, on campus, but also it is known across the country as a fabulous collection. Many times Laurel has prepared uh, excuse me, many times as Laurel prepared for today, she said, now I don't want anyone to give me gifts, no gifts. I want everything to go to the collection. So in that note, I'm asking any small and large donations to be made in the name of Laurel Wilson to the Missouri Her Story Costume Collection. She'll love that. <laughs> Laurel is also the recipient of the ITAA Distinguished Scholar Award and the Beth Dunlap Award for Exceptional Demonstration of Costume Studies. And um, Dr. Wilson hails from that big sky country of Montana, where life as a cowboy really does exist. I thought it was Kansas, but it's actually <laughs> Montana. Obviously, it was, it's always been in her blood for most of her career. Dr. Wilson has studied the Western cowboy and cowgirl dress. Whether it was the dude or the dudette, real or imagined, Laurel writes, gives lectures, teaches, and tells stories all over the world about clothing on the on the American West. She has ex executed exhibits all over the country on cowboy dress, but in the 27 years that Laurel has been here, she has never had a cowboy exhibit on this campus or in Columbia. So we put a stop to that. And in honoring her today after her lecture, there's an um, exhibit across the hall in Gwen, in Gwen Hall, across the sidewalk in Gwen Hall, um, that has cowboy dress in it. So it's a wonderful exhibit that um, our costume manager, Nicole Johnston Blatz, and Laurel students did on her behalf. So we, uh, it's a wonderful honor to her. On April, sec on, excuse me, on April 12th, Ellis Library has um, graciously allowed us to put additional exhibits about cowgirl dress. And uh, Laurel will be giving a lecture on uh, April 12th at noon in the main lobby of the library on, a, on the cowgirl. And that, uh, lecture is going to be called Bronco Riding Women. In typical Laurel fashion, I promise it will be entertaining and we hope you can, and can join us on that day. I could go on and on about Laurel's accomplishments, but how much all of us students, faculty, staff love her, her gentle and wise style. <laughs> Life in Tam simply won't be the same without you. <laughs> but it's her turn. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
it wasn't my idea to do this um, <laughs> talk, but uh, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about how Western dress became Western. And um, I wanted to tell you, first of all, why I do Western dress. I grew up on a ranch, and that's my grandfather with me uh, at about age two. And um, you can see that the West is definitely part of my background. Um, when I first became an assistant professor, I was really doing research about home textile production. But I really wanted to go home to Montana to visit my family. And when you're an assistant professor in a publisher parish university, you get panicked about doing uh, research all the time. And so I said to my husband, what can, kind of research can I do when I'm at home in Montana? And he said, well, why don't you compare ranch dress to farm dress? Uh, he, having grown up on a farm, and that's his dad, wearing his bib overalls, which is typical farm dress, to ranch dress, and that's my brother wearing his very typical ranch dress. And so I said, well, that's a good idea, but I think I'll start with ranch dress because I grew up on a ranch. Well, I've never made it to farm dress. <laughs> um, I have found that Western dress has been a fabulous topic because of all these reasons. First of all, there's a lot that's been written about it, but very little systematic study of Western dress. And that's something that I've worked very hard to do is, is systematic study. There are endless ways to look at it. I've looked at it from uh, dressing dudettes and other little cowboys looking at children in various situations all wearing Western dress to dress of dude ranches, rodeo riders, and working cowboys. Working cowboys, I think, are probably my favorite, as you will see. Um, it's recognized worldwide. Uh, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Brazil, my husband was wearing his Western-style hat, and somebody took a look at him and said, hello, Texas, <laughs> thinking that that was really the West, but it's really Montana. <laughs> it's still worn and still changing. So it really doesn't uh, remain as any kind of dress. It's influenced by lots of other factors. Um, it's a topic of fascination. I think that any time we look at regional dress of any area, why it's fascinating to people. Um, and it certainly is a symbol of American individualism. And of course, lastly, it has a great deal of personal meaning to me. So, how did Western dress become Western? Um, first of all, if you take a look at Western dress, there are certain kinds of recognizable elements. Um, carved leathers, um, bright and sometimes dull um, metals, and this one happens to be a concho. Um, in the early days, it was called a concha. And so sometime in about the 1950s or 60s, it changed spelling. And then we see the bright woven textiles. Um, and I'm wearing a <laughs> Chamayo vest uh, from the Southwest. And eventually it melded into uh, North and South and became sort of a pan-Western look. The origins of Western dress can be traced back to these four main influences. And, and there are others that I'm going to talk about at the very end but these are the four main influences. Spanish, because they were the ones that really developed cowboy culture or cattle culture. The frontiersmen, um, Native Americans, and then of course the American cowboy. Changes in technology definitely influenced the form of dress. And so we see the rayon satin shirt. Um, we see the uh, coated slicker. And we see the influence of uh, chrome tanning. Chrome tanning made leathers uh, soft and flexible and made it possible to dye them unusual colors. Uh, those shafts happened to be orange, but they even had purple and chartreuse, which is rather interesting when you think of cowboys. Um, and it enabled people to be able to put all kinds of what were known as spots in the shafts. Um, spots were metal brads that would perforate the uh, leather. And in oak tanned leather, it would have made them tear. But because of chrome tanning, the leather was supple enough 
uh, that it didn't tear. And so all of a sudden we started seeing hundreds of spots inserted into shafts. And, um, and then the ones in the middle are rodeo shafts and they have mylar um, adhered to the leather. So the, all different kinds of technologies affect Western dress. So the very first group are um, Spanish dress. And it uh, originated in Salamanca, I think that's how you pronounce it, Spain, with low crowned hats. And this one is a 17th century, um, I guess you'd call him cowboy. Uh, <laughs> He's carrying a spear. They didn't use lariats or riatas at that point in time. They actually used this spear to cut the, um, the, the uh, tendon above the hoof and the, the ca cattle would fall down. So they didn't try to stop the cattle in a gentle way. They were looking for meat. And uh, that did change, thank goodness. Um, but they wore low-crowned hats, bolero jackets, tight-fitting trousers, sashes, uh, boots, and spurs, all of which eventually became some parts of some uh, forms of cowboy dress. Let's see if I can step away just a bit. Um, they found differences in the New World, and one of the things um, that New World changed cowboy dress was that they needed leather in the lower parts of the uh, rider because the kind of vegetation in the southwest was a thorny vegetation, and so they needed protection. And so uh, chaparreros were developed uh, to protect the rider. Uh, the very first ones I don't have an image of here, but it was armas, which were tied to the rider's uh, saddle. And um, that, if the, cow, if the horse fell down, the cowboy would be trapped, and so they started putting the protection on the person instead of on the horse. The charro, uh, who was the uh, traditional horseman of Mexico, also contributed some ideas to Western dress. Uh, you can see the calcioneros, uh, his pants that have the design up the sides. Um, lots of embroidery on leather. Uh, large hats with decoration, so a very decorative form of Western dress. And that decoration still exists, but to a lesser degree, uh, and sometimes to a, a greater degree, depending on when and where. You can see in this image of um, these people are from Santa Fe, and you can see that some of them include some of those charro um, characteristics in their clothing. Spanish dress also appeared in popular culture. And uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West is the black and white photograph. And you can see um, the, some of the embroidery, a sash. Uh, let's see. Yeah, two of the men are wearing embroidered shirts, and one of them is wearing a serape draped across. And then the dime novels often included images that had sort of a Spanish flavor. So the short bolero jacket and the sash were uh, part of the dime novel covers in many cowboy stories. And then, of course, to show how strong Coates and Clark's thread was, you've got a Spanish-looking cowboy uh, with the rope. But in 1898, we had the Spanish-American War. And all of a sudden, Spanish characteristics changed into something villainous. And who better to dress in Spanish style would be the villain Trampas from the Virginian. Um, a story written by uh, Owen Wister and um, performed on stage for the first time in 1904. And that Spanish characteristic didn't come back into uh, Western dress until the 1910s when rodeo women started wearing bell-bottom pants with all sorts of Spanish characteristics, as well as sashes uh, and boleros. And it was women that brought it back, not men. Frontier dress um, was influenced by Native American dress because it was durable and leather. Um, and so we see Davy Crockett in the top image um, this is Four Bears, painted by Catlin in 1832. And uh, that is a self-image of Daniel Boone, aged 14. 
So he was already seeing himself as a frontiersman uh, at that point in time. Um, the fur trader and mountain man uh, were common images, and of course, Missouri was really the heart of the fur trading culture. Um, and so uh, Joe Meek um, was one of the important tr fur traders up on the upper Missouri. And the other two images were um, William uh, G. LaFontaine's uh, drawings of mountain men that he observed when he was out uh, in the West. And you can see that it blends that Native American idea with that sort of fringed leather look, which has also become part of Western dress. And you'll see that in our exhibit. Um, you can see that others also adopted it. So there's the Buntline Bunch, uh, Buffalo Bill and um, Wild Bill Hickok are in that image. Uh, Wild Bill, you can see, is seated um, second from the left, and Buffalo Bill is standing next to him. And um, Oma Hundru is the was the cowboy of the bunch. But they're all wearing sort of frontiersman looks, which was considered sort of the West at that during the 1880s when those images were taken. And of course, Buffalo Bill wearing his bucket boots, and his bucket boots can be traced way back to the 17th century when French cavaliers were wearing them. He does not have the boot hose on. So disappointing, they were so good. <laughs> Even George Armstrong Custer imitated Buffalo Bill in his fringed coat. So um, we see imitations um, being influenced uh, throughout. Theodore Roosevelt wearing his fringed jacket and he's wearing um, chaps, uh, probably calfskin chaps. But um, not a Westerner, but when he wanted to look like one, he dressed like one. And this is Larry Larum, who remained on the New York Social Register in spite of the fact of living outside of Cody, Wyoming, 52 miles out in the mountains at Valley Ranch, which is a dude ranch, but he needed to convince those dudes that he too was a Westerner, and he wore fringes to illustrate that, along with cowboy boots, of course. But probably the most important influence was cowboy dress. And here we see a bunch of young cowboys all wearing very stereotypical cowboy dress. And one reason that they did so was because they were young. Um, the age of cowboys really definitely influenced what, how they dressed. And you can see that most cowboys were young. And most images of cowboys are of young cowboys. There are very few stereotypical, ugh, that's awful when I do that, um, <laughs> very stereotypical images of uh, Cow of older cowboys. You see them working, but you don't see them wearing chaps, bandanas, and guns. This is Teddy Blue Abbott, and it looks like he just had a bender, <laughs> <laughs> which is pro very probable. He had just come from a, a cattle drive from Texas and uh, ended up in North Platte, Nebraska, where the cattle drive ended and he bought his new clothes. And he said that he felt like he was dressed just right for the first time in his life because he had bought a new hat, a new Stetson that cost $10, a new shirt, which is a, it was known as a bicycle shirt, unbeknownst to him, um, a new pair of pants and a new pair of boots, and they were exactly the kind of clothes that top hands wore. And he went home to Omaha, and his sister said, take your pants out of your boots and put on your coat. You look like an outlaw. And he never went home again. <laughs> he ended up in Montana. This is DJ O'Malley, who gave the uh, title to my very first uh, article. He said, I was a pretty proud kid when I had this picture taken. I'd just gotten my first gun. And it was a, and my, let's see, my first pair of shafts and my gun, and it was a pearl handled one too. So all of those important um, pieces that made him a cowboy. 
He went back to um, Wisconsin where he was a fireman for most of his life, but when he died, he asked that his body be shipped back to Mile City, Montana, and that's where it is today. So he, in his heart, he remained a cowboy. And of course, one of Missouri's own um, became one of Montana's favorite sons, and that was Charlie Russell, the cowboy artist. And you'll see a couple of images, not of cowboys, but a couple of his paintings here. Here are two young cowboys in their brand new shafts proving that they have reached the lofty ideal of being a cowboy. And um, you can see their guns are really important to them. <laughs> These are shotgun chaps. Um, they're called shotgun chaps because when you laid them down and the two legs, and you looked up the two legs, it looked like a stacked shotgun. And uh, this is a pair of woolly chaps, uh, also at the Montana Historical Society. Uh, this form actually came from California, but it was readily adopted on the Northern Plains because um, anything that has air spaces provides warmth. And of course, all those little bits of um, goat angora locks uh, provided warmth. Shipley Saddlery was located in Kansas City, Missouri, right next to the stockyards, and the building is still there. You can still see Shipley Saddlery on the uh, top of it. And, um, but they sold all kinds of cowboy goods all over the West, and um, this one um, shows some of the various styles of hats. Uh, the big four, you can see that the better the quality, the higher the cost. And so. Um, the 3X beaver has more beaver fur in it than any other fur, and so it cost $10, and that's the kind that Teddy Blue bought for himself. Most uh, cowboy hats were pretty floppy, and that's because they had other kinds of fur in them, either muskrat fur, rabbit fur, uh, but not beaver fur. Beaver fur made the very best felt. Bandanas were also really important parts of the cowboy costume. Um, and I say costume because after the trail rides, they weren't all that regularly used. But during the trail riding period, you needed to cover your face because breathing all that dust would have been fatal. And so, but they used it for protecting the back of their neck from getting sunburned and as a towel and all kinds of other things. Um, all these three come from the Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City, and uh, you can see our cowboy, I think he's from Colorado, uh, wearing the uh, bandana in a characteristic way. The word bandana comes from tie-and-dye uh, silk textiles from um, India, and um, a really fancy cowboy would want to buy a silk bandana imported from India because they really were special. And um, in fact, if you go to the Arabia Steamboat Museum in Kansas City, you can actually see some bolts of bandana uh, imported from India that resemble these. Uh, cowboy boots, uh, these were well worn. And that was another one of young cowboys' yearnings, is they had to have a pair of boots. And the best boots were from Olathe, Kansas, which is just south of Kansas City. And um, they usually bought them a size too small. And John Rawlinson tells about the misery of trying to break his boots in. And finally, an old cowboy told him how, what to do. They said, fill those boots with oats, dump some water in, leave them overnight, the oats will swell up, you dump the oats out and wear them dry. And then you have a pair of boots that fits. I can't imagine wearing <laughs> boots that are a size too small or wet. But. And here were a variety of styles of mail order boots. And uh, that's probably what Teddy or, um, John Rawlinson consulted in order to buy his. Uh, shat, or, uh, spurs were also an important part of cowboy gear. Uh, these are all a variety of styles at the Montana Historical Society. Those extremely cruel looking ones uh, probably were gaucho spurs from South America, uh, not Montana spurs. Uh, you really didn't want to damage your horse. 
Nativity also makes a real difference in terms of how people dress. And you'll notice that in 1880, there were more cowboys who had been born in Missouri and in Ohio than any other place. Texas is clear down there at number eight. And so Missouri had an important impact on Western cowboy culture. One of the things is in the kinds of clothing that they choose. And so uh, woolen trousers were comfortable, they were warm, and when you're riding a horse in, in stiff jeans, um, and they called them overalls at the time, why you could actually end up with calluses on your knees. But if you had um, a nice soft pair of woolen pants that were a little worn out, why it would be a little more comfortable. Uh, these are at the Cowboy Museum and they were actually made in Davenport, Iowa. Um, overalls were found on the, in cowboy culture and uh, that advertisement came uh, up in the top left-hand corner came from the Miles City Yellowstone Journal. Um, so we know that those kinds of things were available up there in the Northern Plains. Um, the image of the young man wearing the riveted overalls um, was taken in Nebraska. Um, these tear-proof jeans um, were also made in Davenport, Iowa, and they're tear-proof because they're herringbone, not the regular um, twill jean that we tend to think about with jeans today. They weren't really tear-proof, but there's always hope. Um, you can see that they do not have belt loops. Belt loops did not become part of cowboy dress until after World War I. And um, so cowboys did wear galluses, which are suspenders. And uh, the way they made their pants fit was to tighten up that back belt. Hickory um, was a, the name of a fabric that was used to make a strong, um, superior wearing quality shirt. And um, you could find hickory, in fact, um, they still call the uh, if you think about the black or uh, blue and white striped um, bib overalls, that's really what hickory cloth would be today. Um, this is a hickory shirt that's at the Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City. And I wish I had a picture of it with its matching necktie. It even has its own matching necktie. So even though this is a work shirt, you could dress it up a little bit. Uh, collarless dress shirts were also used, and um, these shirts are at the Cowboy Museum, and the picture is uh, another one from the uh, same image of the riveted overall picture. But you can see they buttoned their shirt right up to the neck. Shirts at this point in time were really considered underwear and not really appropriate to be seen in polite public. And so um, they wanted to stay buttoned up. Um, vests um, also were not something that came up from the Spanish areas of the country, but certainly came from the East. And they were really useful pieces. One of the most important things they did, in addition to providing a little bit war of warmth, but they had handy pockets for smokins. Everybody smoked, and they had Bull Durham tobacco, and they had to, of course, have a place for their tobacco pouch and their papers to make their cigarettes. Uh, Ready-mades were simply too expensive for cowboys. Native American design um, kind of faded during the essentially Indian troubles of the uh, mid to, oh, about 18, oh, even into the 1890s. Um, and these are both Charles M. Russell images, but uh, we have two views of Native Americans, uh, one of these um, terrifying marauders and the other is the vanishing race. And uh, toward the turn of the century, why the whole idea of the vanishing race was becoming prevalent and Native American design started coming back in and even appeared, and of course also Native Americans were being confined on reservations and making all kinds of goods 
that they needed to sell in order to feed themselves because unfortunately the government who'd promised to take good care of them didn't and they needed to earn some money. And so we see woven blankets, um, we see um, Indian themes, um, the swastika was an important Native American symbol that of course disappeared after the Nazis adopted a similar style. And uh, so um, you almost know that uh, anything with a swastika on it would predate World War II. Uh, this is from Shipley's, so even Shipley Saddlery carried blankets and of course um, most of these uh, companies really touted how wonderful these Native American blankets worked as saddle blankets. Um, during the Dude Ranch era, which really began in the, uh, well, the earliest one is Wolf Ranch, which had its beginnings in the late 19th century, but um, that started expanding in the teens, and then the golden era of Dude Ranching was from the 1920s 30s and 40s uh, when it became uncomfortable to do grand tours in Europe. So a lot of wealthy people, instead of going to Europe, spent their summers at dude ranches in the Rocky Mountains and in their winters down around Wickenburg, uh, Arizona. And they often had um, Native Americans come and do ceremonies um, and dances um, at the dude ranches. And that was another way that Native Americans could make money. Uh, these are probably from the Crow tribe or the Cheyenne tribe. Um, this, uh, the Harding Curio Company is in Co was in Cody, Wyoming, and you can see that they carried all kinds of woven goods, baskets, pottery, and all kinds of jewelry. And I think it's the Dude Ranch that really helped to create the pan-western look because this is at Valley Ranch where Larry Larum was the owner. And uh, we see the Southwest Dudine, the Northwest Dudine, the uh, third woman, the woman in the skirt is Irma Larum, uh, Larry Larum's wife. And then we see the, the Eastern Dudine who did not adopt Western dress. But I think that this is where uh, the melding of Western style really took place. So, changes in technology. Uh, chrome tanning was really important. And uh, so we see all different kinds of metal materials that were made. Uh, that particular pair of shaps, uh, the prize winner shaps, it says it's nicely spotted. And I, ha I looked at a pair at the uh, Range Rider Museum in uh, um, Mile City, Montana, that had over 500 spots, and they weighed about five pounds more than a regular pair of shaps. They had been owned by the uh, mayor of the town, who never ever wore a horse, but he wore his shaps, and he wore them just in his during frontier days. Um, uh, I think it was called front. No, it was called. Oh, I can't remember what it's called in Mile City. But he wore the whole three rows of, sha of spots were completely worn off because he walked around the sidewalks. <laughs> and uh, concrete is real rough on leather and shafts, or on leather and spots. Um, here are some examples of um, frontier, or, uh, yeah, frontier days in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And the cowboy in the uh, right-hand corner and the left-hand corner in the bottom picture are both wearing very heavily spotted chaps. Um, now, rodeo also made a big difference in terms of dress because um, you wanted something that flapped because it made you look like a better rider. And so woolies were really good because all those locks would flap up and down and then bat wings would flap up and down, and if they had metal spots on them, the sun would shine, and of course, it looked like they were doing an amazing job. Now, cowboys wear shafts, rodeo shafts that have long fringes, and instead of buckling down to the ankle, they only buckle to the knee, so the whole front of the shaft will flap, and um, that helps to create the show. 
because um, the horse is, is graded, the rider is graded, and together they get the score. Um, this is a bucking belt worn by an anonymous cowboy. Um, the, the one down there is from the Glendive, Montana Roundup of 1919, uh, worn by George F. Gardner, and uh, also a bucking belt. And not too many cowboys wear bucking belts anymore, but they are wearing padded vests, which protects them to a degree. And some cowboys are even wearing helmets, which is quite a change. Uh, some cowboys are resisting it. Uh, to their peril. Trophy buckles became part of Western dress um, because of rodeo, and that is Jackson Sundown, um, at the, and he won that buckle at the Pendleton, um, Oregon Rodeo. Um, and the middle buckle was made by Edward Bullen, who eventually started designing silver-mounted saddles for the Hollywood group. And then down there, you see a whole bunch of cowboys, again, anonymous cowboys, uh, photographed by Hardy, but uh, wearing a variety of buckles and carrying um, trophies. This is Dave Appleton, who won the all-around cowboy uh, title in 1988. And uh, he's actually Australian, not um, American at all. But he certainly is wearing all that cowboy finery. Then, the movies um, have affected cowboy dress, but cowboy dress first affected the movies. So I didn't put them in as one of my four influences, but um, they certainly are important today. Um, you'll, I didn't have to introduce you to uh, Roy Rogers. I think most of you, at least most of you who are a little older, would recognize him. Um, the other two are William Hart and Snowy uh, Baker uh, from 1914. And you can see that they adopted cowboy dress. The, the woolies are definitely there. And then Rodeo Ben and Nudie Cohen were both cowboy tailors, um, very famous for their opulent cowboy outfits. And those were made by Rodeo Ben for Gene Autry. And smile pockets became important. And the garment that we have on exhibit over at the library has smile pockets, and uh, they were worn by Mabel Einheiser. Um, and here we see Western fashion. So it's an am amalgam of lots of different influences. Uh, you can see the Southwest jewelry, the squash blossom necklaces from the Navajo. Um, the man in the middle is wearing a definitely Rodeo Ben influenced or Nudie Cohen influenced shirt. And then we see the leathers and the fringes. So um, that is all part of Western dress. And these are some of the institutions from which I've gotten my information. Are there any questions? OK. Now I'd like to invite you all to come over and see the really beautiful exhibit um, that has been created by my grad class. And John Leach contributed the two photographs that are on display that I think provide the backdrop that is perfect for the exhibit. Um, most of the pieces of clothing came from Howard Marshall. Uh, during his time um, at uh, doing research about Nevada buckaroos, and uh, you'll see a white dress there that doesn't look like it belongs, but she was queen of the American Royal Stock Show in 1962. And uh, actually, I'd like my grad students who worked on this exhibit to stand up and be recognized. This is, yeah, stand up. And Nicole, Nicole, you have to stand up too. We're, we're missing Mona Imadi and uh, Jessica Ridgeway, but I do hope you'll all take a chance, or a, a, not a chance, take an opportunity <laughs> to talk with these uh, young women who have done really good research to put together this exhibit. So, thanks.